hand it over to my host for the day, Amit and Vinayak. And they'll take you through the best practices that needs to be followed and how you can inculcate these habits in your day-to-day -day activities, in your day-to-day -day development to make sure that your projects are always up to speed and in correct accordance. With that, over to you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Sajay. So, a warm welcome to everyone here. Uh, I'm Amit Savaria. I'm a technical lead at Horizontal Digital. Hi, I'm Vinayak. I'm Salesforce developer at Horizontal Digital. Thank you for joining us on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, that takes a little bit of effort, huh? <laughs> Waking up early on Saturday morning, coming here. Okay. All right, so we'll get started. CI/CD. So it's basically a software development approach to take your code of whatever multiple developers are working together, building it, integrate it in a single repository, and then deploying it, uh, delivering it efficiently and reliably into higher environments. And all this happens with automated tests and builds. So basically, all of your effort that you would have spent on uh, doing those deployment manually is taken over by CI-CD. The first part of CI-CD is continuous integration. So this is the part where multiple developers working together can integrate their code efficiently together. They can minimize the conflicts that might happen on work when working with the same components. And uh, it also helps us automate the testing process. So like whenever you have done the uh, builds, you have to actually deploy those components to a QA environment. And uh, before that, the validations will happen. And you have to do all of that manually if you're not using CI CD. So what CI does, continuous integration does, is it, it automates that for you. So it will actually build that package. It will validate it against the target org. And then if the uh, changes are passed, we'll move on to the next stage of continuous integration, which is continuous delivery. So continuous delivery extends our continuous integration by delivering those packages that have been automatically built by continuous integration to a higher environment. What it does is it allows us to build a pipeline workflow so we can actually customize whatever happens once that package has been built. So we can actually do the validations, we can uh, implement our own code quality checks to ensure that whatever code that is going to production is efficient. So it's uh, basically working tip top condition. And uh, once it's in production, there are no bugs that could arise from that. So some, in some places, you'll actually see that CD is, instead of being called uh, continuous delivery, it might be called continuous deployment. And that's just a, another step on top of that. And that just means that whenever your release happens to production, so a continuous deployment is one way of looking at that approach. So how your release will happen to your production environment. If you are working in like a mobile industry, not Salesforce, you have to actually release your component to the public. So that approach uh, is uh, usually termed as continuous deployment. But we can overall term it under continuous delivery as the umbrella term. Okay, so before CI/CD, flashback time, let's go back and look at all the different deployment methods that we have available in Salesforce. So the most common one you would have seen if you're working on the Salesforce platform, you know about is chain sets. That's the one thing we actually can't show you with development docs, because development docs don't have that. But uh, I've got some screenshots which will explain it. So for those that don't know, ChainSets is a built-in tool in Salesforce for deploying your changes from one sandbox to the next and to the production environment. To set up ChainSets, uh, what you have to do is you have to create a deployment connection between your source and target sandbox or your target org, so your production or and development environment. You'll set up the deployment connection. The code will go from source to target or the uh, other way around. After that, you will build your outbound chain set. So this is basically kind of you telling what all components I want to deploy to my target org. Here you'll add your components, then upload it to the uh, your target environment, target sandbox. Once your chain set has been deployed to the target environment, then uh, it will be available in under the inbound chain sets. In the inbound chain sets, you will first validate it. Once the validation has successfully passed, then you will deploy your components. The big problem with chain sets is, even though they are like built-in tool, they are pretty easy to use, all happens on the UI, is they have a limited support for components. You can't actually deploy all the components with chain sets. And pretty common things as well, like if you're changing the name of a standard object or a standard field, you can't deploy that with chain set. So even pretty common things which you expect that you would be able to deploy, you can't do that with chain sets. And the second problem with chain set is you can't automate it. So it has all to be uh, it has it has all to be a manual process. You have to create your chain sets. You have to actually upload it, validate it, and deploy it. It all has to be done by some person. The second tool that uh, 
some of you might recognize the ones that have been working in the Salesforce platform for quite some time, you might recognize the force.com migration tool. The name for this has changed quite a lot. At the uh, base of this, this is basically Apache Ant. On top of that, uh, we are building, uh, Salesforce has built their own automation. Uh, they've built a library. You uh, use that library to do the deployments from your sandboxes to the higher environment. So in this one, uh, the one thing that has recently changed is this has been deprecated in winter 2024. So the last version for this is uh, version 59. After that, uh, you can, uh, the tool is still working, but how long it will work and how long, uh, there's no support uh, being done, uh, done for this. So how long it will work, we don't know. You can still use it if you're still using this. But if you've already uh, like stopped using this, that's good. You should move on to the new recommended method. We'll talk about this. The good thing about uh, force.com migration tool was that uh, we could deploy all those components that uh, changes couldn't. And also we could use it uh, to automate. So before, uh, like in the earlier implementations of CI/CD, this was the basis for that. Now we have a uh, quick look at the different files that we used to use with force.com migration tool. You basically create uh, three different files to use it. You had your build XML, which was basically your different commands. You build properties, uh, which was containing your credentials for your environments, so source, target, and then finally the package XML, which described all the components that you actually want to deploy to the target environment, right? And then example of that. The recommended method now is using Salesforce CLI. Even this has changed the names. So previously it was used to call SFDX CLI. Now it's called Salesforce CLI. We are at version 2.0 of this. The commands have changed a little bit. It was all used to be SFDX, force, columns, this, this, this. Now it's just SF. It simplified more natural language. So the best thing about this one is it integrates with VS Code. It's a source code editor. So somewhere between your Notepad++ and your full-fledged IDEs like Visual Studio or Eclipse, it's pretty efficient, fast, and has the plugin system. So that plugin system is what Salesforce uses to plug in their Salesforce CLI into uh, VS Code. And uh, the good thing is you get a little bit of the UI features back. With force.com migration tool, you didn't get any UIs. You had to do it all from like command prompt. Now, with, uh, when you're using the Salesforce CLI with VS Code, you get that little bit of UI elements back. You can retrieve changes, deploy changes, again, using the UI of VS Code. So get your commands built into that. It supports all the components that Salesforce has right now. So LWC components, anything. If, actually, if you have to build the LWC components, you can't do that on the old uh, uh, developer console. You have to use VS Code with Salesforce CLI, right? So, this supports uh, package examples as well. The same package examples that you used with uh, force.com migration tool, those are supported here as well. And uh, of course, this can be automated. That's why we are going to be using this for the CI/CD. Now that we have talked about uh, the various deployment methods available in Salesforce ecosystem, let's talk about Git and Git repositories a little bit. So Git is basically your code versioning system. So you have a version control system for your code. So one problem that Salesforce has, if you're working on uh, like code, if you're working with Apex classes, and let's say there are two developers that have to work on the same class. A big issue is that you don't want to override each other's changes. And uh, what you have to do is coordinate a lot you have to talk to each other. I'm doing the deployment, don't make any changes until my changes are in there. Once the changes are there, then take the retrieve, then do the deployments. So that happens a lot, right? If you're not using CI, CD or some version control system, this is a common issue for all of us. So with uh, Git and Git repositories, what we get uh, is a kind of a common repository where all of our code stays. And uh, it basically allows us, uh, multiple developers, to work together parallelly. And uh, what we can do is create branches from uh, those main repository. And every developer would have their own branch. They will work on that. And then we will merge it all together. So this uh, is what like, uh, it also tracks our changes effectively. So I'll show it to you uh, later on. But uh, whatever change you're making, if you have to get it reviewed, the changes will appear in like what, have been, uh, what new has been added and what uh, has been removed from the code. So it makes it pretty easy to look at that later as well. So also here's a look at like uh, how the Git repositories look. This is actually GitHub, one of the Git repositories. And uh, that diagram is pretty common one. You might have seen it if you have ever uh, like searched for Git or Git repositories, you would have looked at that diagram. And it's a pretty common one. I've uh, labeled some of the icons that I'm using over here. And actually, this will be repeated quite a lot in this presentation. Uh, but yeah, so basically what we have is a main branch replicated by, uh, 
here presented by this main line over here, then from there, a new branch is getting created, some changes are being added to that, and from then on, we are again merging that branch to the main branch. So that's like kind of the flow of uh, Git repositories and using Git. You basically create your branches, make your changes, and then merge them again together, right? So now, I hope you have a good understanding of like what uh, deployment methods we have available and what are the different branching, uh, what are the different uh, Git, uh, Git and Git repositories available to us, right? So uh, now uh, we were talking about branches. So let's uh, quickly talk about branching strategies. Branching strategies is basically like uh, if you're working in a Salesforce project and depending on your team, what sort of branches should you create? You'll always have a master branch for your production code. That's a common one. But what about the other branches? So some of you might create one branch for each of your environment, for your QA, for your UAT environment, you will create one branch. Some of you might even create an irrational branch for your hotfixes, for integrations that are not uh, like linked with a specific uh, environment. But that all depends on the need of your project and your team, how big of your team is. If you have some organizations are so big, they have actually multiple development teams from multiple organizations working for them. So it gets quite complicated. And I'll actually show you an example of like a branching strategy. So let's start from the beginning, right? So we have our production org over here, and we created a master uh, branch, or like master is the trunk. So we created a Git repository that gave us the master branch itself. So what we will do is from our production, we'll take our code, and this is an example where like we are already working in an environment where the production already has some code. We've already deployed some changes over there, and then we are adopting CI/CD, right? So what we will do is we'll take all of our code from the production org, and we'll put it on our master branch. Then from I also have some glossary terms at the bottom. So in the next diagrams, whatever I show you, these will help. These will also be present at the bottom, so you can uh, like look at that and understand what each of those uh, icons means. So you basically take your uh, production's copy, put it in the master branch. Now that you have all of your code in the master branch, that actually becomes your source of truth. So whatever changes are present in the master should be present in production. Because initially you created it from, mass, uh, from production, so both of them were at the same level, right? So any changes you do in master now should go back into your production. So this is your source of truth. And uh, what we will do is from the master branch, we will create some additional branches. And these are for my specific environments for the QA environment and for the UAT environment. It depends on your project. You might have some different name for your sandboxes, for your environments. In my case, I'm talking about QA and UAT. So what we did is we created uh, the uh, new branches from the master. And we established a little bit of continuous integration with the QA environment and UAT environment. Basically, whenever a change is made in these branches, this will be again be sent to these environments. So whatever code that you merge to these branches, that gets sent to the QA and UAT environment. How it will work with a uh, your development orgs or your development environments, your development server boxes, is you will actually create a feature branch from master. So that's your source of truth. So you create a feature branch from that. You'll do your development. You make your changes in your development environment, retrieve them, edit them in your ID, preferred ID. In our case, usually that's VS Code. Then once the changes are good, we've unit tested them in the development uh, sandbox. We will again push those changes to the feature branch. So this feature branch is basically your user stories. So let's say you got a requirement that you need to uh, develop a new LWC component. So for that uh, developing that new LWC component, you will create a new feature branch from master. You'll work on that. Once that uh, LWC component is ready for deployment to the higher environment, you will push your changes to the feature branch. Okay. So that's uh, represented over here by this yellow uh, icons, which are actually commits. So commits is basically uh, when you're making changes to a, uh, to a branch, those are your commits. And Vinayak will actually show it to you in action how these all actually works. And once you have done that, what you will do is you'll create a, merge, uh, a pull request. So you'll basically try to merge your feature branch into the QA branch for the higher environment branch. When you do that, you can have automated validations run. This will all be configured using CI CD. So you'll have a validation pipeline created, which will trigger as soon as your code is merged from a feature branch to that QA environment's branch. And that will validate your changes against the QA environment. So your QA sandbox, it will validate the changes in that. And after that, it will uh, the continuous integration, uh, continuous delivery will kick in, and it will take your changes that has been validated successfully, and it will push it to the QA org. 
Then the same process continues again for your UAT. So once the QA has signed off that it all looks good, that's when you will go on to the next step and the UAT will happen. And the same thing again will happen with, with your clients as well. So once your changes has been validated by the client and they are good with it, it looks good to them. They have requested all the color changes on all the title headings changes that they want. Then you will push it to the production. It's ready for release, right? For the production release cycle, you basically go through that uh, kind of, it's like an inverse waterfall. So you take your feature branch, merge it to QA. Once from QA, that's been validated, you merge it to UAT. Once in UAT, it's been validated, you are ready for your production release. So I've made the diagram a little bit simpler. I've removed all the CI, uh, the developer and the stuff, etc. But I hope this is clear enough. So we started with a master branch, and from there, two different developers created their own feature branches. So the feature one branch was started earlier on. The developer made some commits. He's still working on that. Meanwhile, for the same component, another developer created another feature branch. He also has to make some changes. So both of them are working on the similar things, and. Uh, what is happening over here is they have both created their own branches because of course like each developer would have their own feature branch. Feature branches, again, user stories. So one developer per user story, right? So here each developer has their own feature branch from master and the feature two's uh, developer completes his uh, development first and he is ready to merge his changes back again. So here let's say uh, that we are skipping over the QA and UAT to make it simplified, but his changes get to uh, the production first. Now what happens is the production, the master branch has some new changes which the feature one branch doesn't. So and if they are working on the same component, what that gives us is conflicts. So there's already an updated component in production and the feature one developer is working on it on an older version of that component. So now what we do is we create a pull request or we pull the changes from master again for the feature one developer. So he basically, as soon as like, if there is a change available in master, he basically has to pull all of those changes again in his feature branch to get all the updated components and then continue on with his development. Then, sorry, then he will be ready again to merge his changes to production and then the like flow will work as normal. But in any case, like if there are multiple developers working on the, uh, on the same environment and uh, some developers changes switches to master first and you are still working on some component and those components uh, are the same uh, like common ones and uh, those changes that the other developer has made would affect your component. So you need to take the pull from the master and integrate into your feature branch before you continue your work. So we talked a lot about like how branching etc works. Uh, let's talk, this was an example that I presented. Let's see different examples that we have in Salesforce, uh, like usually with organizations use with Salesforce ecosystem. The most common of them is using Git as a backup. So here, the only thing you are doing is you are keeping a copy of each of your environment into different branches on Git. That's all. No validations, no automations, no pipelines. The only thing is whenever there is a new change in developer org or like your queue org, you are pushing, uh, pushing those changes to a branch and you're keeping that as a backup. Which is actually, this strategy is very rarely used. Many, if there's only a small uh, developer, like one or second, uh, one or two developers working on something, they're only doing it for themselves, then they would usually use this to kind of keep a backup of their development environment. The second pretty commonly used, uh, and this is pretty basic again, uh, branching strategy is feature branch model. Here you only have one master branch and Every developer will create a feature branch from that master. You don't have any additional branches, just master and feature branches. Feature branches, you can have multiple, of course. So like n number of developers, n number of feature branches. So they will all have their feature branches, but there will only be another uh, one single master branch and no additional branches. And once the changes are completed in feature, they will again be merged to the master. From then on, what we have is the protected master branch. Here, the only thing different is we have additional uh, branches that uh, the feature branches will merge into first and then only the code will go to the master branch. So there are actually different ways of what uh, protected means for a master branch. You could also say the protected just means that uh, no actual changes can be done on the master branch itself. But in this example, what I'm showing over here, there's basically another level of branch where you have to merge your feature branches first and then you will actually merge them to the master branch. And then comes the, the most common one which bigger organizations use 
is the expanded branching model, where for each of your Salesforce environment, you have a specific branch and you have to follow that whole process. So this is quite similar to what I was showing you in the earlier diagrams, where each of my environment, the QA org, the UAT org, they, they each had their own um, branches. And I had to merge them in that waterfall manner where uh, I completed my feature branches code, I merged them into the QA, uh, QA branch, then from the QA branch, once it was validated by the QA, it was, I merged them to UAT, and then from there, we released it to production. So these are different uh, branching strategies uh, examples. So let's talk about that. Uh, we'll jump onto a demo, because I've talked for quite some time now, and uh, Vinayak will explain how you create your branches, push your changes to them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Amit, for explaining Git branching strategies and how uh, we need to work and how CICD works and how things move from one org to another using feature branches. Now let me demonstrate you the same. So what we need, uh, suppose I have a requirement uh, that, uh, so this is my uh, source org or the org one in which I do the development and I need to uh, reflect the changes uh, in the another org, right? So this is we have uh, this is my target org, and we have same component dropped in both the orgs. So how I will approach it using CI/CD and GitHub Actions? So uh, what I need to do is I need to go to VS Code, and uh, this is my VS Code screen. I have created a project with Manifest. I have authorized my uh, dev org, which is here source org, and currently I am on the master branch. So uh, what is master branch? Master branch is the branch linked with my target org, right? The changes done here will be reflected in the target org, org if they are pushed. And we cannot directly commit changes in master branch. It is a predicted branch. So what we need to do is we need to create a feature branch from it. So how we'll do it? We need to create a new branch and I'll name it as feature. Okay. So what it has done is it has cloned from the master. Suppose in master branch there are three files A, B and C. So what this feature branch will get is it will directly clone those files also, right? So it is exact replica of the master branch, right? So now master and feature both are at the same level. Now what we need to do is like I need to modify this title. Uh, suppose there is a requirement from client that I need to modify this title. Uh, I'll do it here in my VS code uh, parent. Let's, let's name this title. Uh, make the changes. Uh, version control, uh, source control will detect the changes. Git will track it locally. And when I go here, it is showing me the changes, right? It is showing me the modifications which I have done. Now what I need to do is I need to stage those changes. Staging means confirming that I am confirmed that I need to proceed with these files. And now I need to commit it. First, I need to uh, deploy it to source to verify that my changes are reflected in my uh, per, uh, org one or the source org, right? So I can do it by going on file, clicking, right clicking it and deploy source to org. So my source org is currently verified here, authorized here and uh, yeah, let me uh, check the changes if they are reflected here. Now I can proceed further with GitHub. Right? So I have staged the changes, that means I am confirmed with this file. Now I need to add a commit message. So this branch was made locally on my local computer. Now I need to publish it to the GitHub repository. Right? So I need to publish this branch. This is the GitHub repository. Here uh, we can see all the branches. Right? And I am currently uh, logged in as Vinayak. And now what I, uh, this is all the branching strategy, how uh, things work. I need to check whether my code which I pushed from my local machine is reflected here or not. So see, uh, this is called the commit and uh, this is being reflected here, right? I have modified the title with a file. It is reflected here. So this is all the branching strategy and uh, how we create branches from our local machine using the master branch, cloning the master branch, making the changes and pushing them to GitHub for further action. CI/CD has not come yet into action. Uh, it is just a Git branching strategy. Now Amit will further explain it. Okay. So before we actually uh, talk about like uh, how CI, uh, look at how CI/CD would come into the picture here, let's quickly talk about some CI/CD solutions available to us. The most common one that is available to us is the built-in CI/CD tools, 
nowadays like all of these Git repositories, GitHub, GitLab, they have their own built-in tools that you can use. The second one is toolchains. So these are basically third-party uh, services that you can use to build your CI CD pipelines. And the third one is complete DevOps solutions. These are specifically made for the Salesforce ecosystems. Let's look at some of examples of them. The integrated ones, of course, they are native to their own Git repositories, too, so they work very well with them. And uh, they are uh, very simple for the first-time developers to set up. And uh, since they are already on your Git repositories, it's pretty easy from, uh, for you to take that code and uh, start building CI-CD pipelines from that. And some examples of there here is uh, for GitHub, we have GitHub Actions. For GitLab, we have GitLab CI-CD. Bitbucket has Bitbucket pipelines. The next uh, solution available to us is the CI-CD tool chains. So these are like uh, basically third-party services. You will use them in, con uh, in collaborations with your uh, Git repositories. So you can mix and match any of them together uh, as whatever suits your needs. So on the left side, you'll see all the different uh, repositories. And the right side has some examples of the CI-CD uh, tool chains. So uh, Jenkins is quite common one. You might have heard of this. Then we have Tra Travis CI, Circle CI, and Bamboo. Bamboo and Bitbucket both are from Atlassian. So Bitbucket has Bitbucket pipelines. And Bitbucket uh, Atlassian also has Bamboo as well. So that was uh, the example of like CI-CD tool chains. The third options we have available is the complete DevOps solutions. These are the ones that are usually bigger organizations will use. And uh, these are specifically targeted for Salesforce ecosystems. So they actually recognize your Apex code. Uh, the other ones, they won't recognize it at, uh, as well. So these will uh, recognize the Salesforce code. They have uh, like integrated uh, checks for handling Salesforce metadata. Because Salesforce metadata is, of course, quite different than your usual Java, Python code. So this handles that uh, much better. This also works with your sandboxes quite better. You can actually integrate uh, these with your sandboxes. So you have the option of logging into your sandbox environments, uh, taking the code directly from those environments. Uh, and of course, they follow the, all the best practices that Salesforce has put on for like your deployments. And examples of these include Gearset, Capardo, Flowsum, Autorabbit. Uh, these names ring a bell, I hope. Some of you might have used one of these tools. So we'll continue on with the demo. So I explained to you like what are different tools we have available. For this demonstration, we'll actually use the first option, which is the natively available integrated uh, CI/CD solution. Over to you, Vinay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Amit, for explaining CI/CD solutions. Now we are going to see how GitHub Actions come into play and how we deploy using GitHub Actions using the pipelines. So I have, uh, as we have earlier see, seen that I have pushed my branch uh, here on the GitHub. Uh, this is the Amit's repository. Let me go to uh, my repo. So yeah, this was my uh, branch and I have uh, like committed my uh, changes here. Now what I need to do is to, I need to first like create a pull request for it. Uh, a pull request is required to validate the changes I have made against the target org. So how I can do that is we will go to the pull request uh, section and we'll create a new pull request. And I'll select my branch uh, and I'll create a pull request against the master because my master is my target, master is authorized against my target org. So changes uh, done in master will be reflected there, right? And as soon as I create, uh, click select my branch, uh, changes are getting reflected here, what files I have changed, right? So I need to create a pull request and I'll assign myself as the reviewer and Amit uh, as the reviewer and myself as the assignee, uh, I'll write a description and it is showing me the file change. So I'll create a pull request. As soon as I press this button, what it will do is it will trigger a GitHub action. And what a GitHub action is, it is a kind of trigger which happens when you create, when you do any action on a certain branch, it is a kind of trigger only. Like we have trigger in Salesforce, we have trigger on create. So it is basically kind of action when a pull request is created against the master branch, then it will validate it. A GitHub action will happen. And let me go to the detail section. So what it is doing is it is uh, basically validating the, those changes against the target org. And it is simply running the CLI commands and uh, authorizing against the org and push, uh, trying to validate the delta changes, not push, 
just trying to validate that the changes I have made are correct or not and uh, they are a good fit for the target org or not. So yeah, it is doing that and meanwhile it is doing that. We can uh, look here also, uh, the build pipeline is running. Uh, it will just validate, not push. Uh, we can go to the uh, target org also and we can see uh, whether the validation trigger uh, in deployment status is showing us or not. And uh, so only GitHub validation is succeeded. It is not yet pushed to uh, our target org. So changes will not reflect here. Uh, yeah. Uh, so now uh, I'll ask Amit to review this PR and uh, take further actions if my code is correct or not. So I told you we'll do a lot of back and forth. So uh, first actually I want to uh, like clear it out. Uh, don't get confused by the terms. GitHub Actions, Better Bucket Pipelines, they are all the same kind of things. Some, uh, some term it as pipelines, some term it as actions. Different environments have different names for it. It's the same thing. Um, so what Vinayak did is he cre uh, created a pull request. The code was validated against the, um, the target org, which was in our case the master uh, linked with master. And uh, then he assigned me as a reviewer for his code. So what that is, uh, that's a, again a process of like a CI CD where you basically streamline giving feedbacks. So if you've worked as a developer, you know like after you've built your components, you have to get it validated from your developer lead or your technical lead. You have to go to them, show them, okay, these are the changes that I've made. If you're not on the premise and if you're not on the call with him and you're not actually showing him, he can't actually tell what changes you have done. So Git and uh, Git repositories make it very easy to actually look at what changes have been done. You, you saw that in uh, like all the additions were showing up in the green color and all the deletions were showing up in the red color. So I can actually take a look and see, okay, all well, these are the changes that he has made. I can review them. If they look good to me, then I can allow them to allow him to uh, merge those changes to the target branch and the, uh, like whatever actions follow on from that. So this practice of giving feedbacks and reviewing the code is quite common one, but Git streamlines it for us. It makes it much easier to actually look at the code, what it needs to be reviewed and uh, what changes have been done. And kind of it uh, enhances that uh, collaboration that uh, usually developers and the developer leads and the reviewers have. And I think this is a good time to look at the CI CD feedback loop. So, this is kind of a uh, pretty common uh, icon that uh, loop that you will see if you search for CICD. What this is basically is showing is an infinite loop of how you start with your planning, you do your changes, you deploy them, then uh, the release happens, uh, sorry, the deployment uh, re release and the deployment happen, you monitor them, and you again start with the whole cycle again. And as you go on with that cycle again and again and again, you uh, keep on iterating and you keep on making yourselves better. So after your reviews, like uh, Vinayak will get the feedbacks, he will learn from that. So it's kind of a loop that will follow on again and again and you as a developer, as an organization will grow from it. Now let me actually show it to you in action, like how that works. So this time around, I'll jump on the screen. And this was the source environment where Vinayak uh, created the pull request. He showed you all the changes he had made. And this I've already opened up uh, the target environment I'm on. I'm logged in here as my user. And uh, when I go to pull request, or actually if I refresh the page, I'll see there's a <coughs> notification for me. From here I can see there's a review requested for me. So I can click on this notification, it will take me directly to that pull request for which Vinayak had requested the review. I can then go to the files change, look at the commit, in this case, I'll go to files change. I'll see, okay, he has changed the name of the lightning card from event with data, there were no spaces, of course. That's not something you can present to the client. You have to make it look presentable. But I noticed something, oh, what? Data has a typo over here. That doesn't fly, right? We can't show that to client. So what I'll do over here, you'll see this plus button showing up over here. So I'll quickly click that and add a comment for Vinayak and I'll click start a review. So this is basically me reviewing a code. And this was a very simple example, just one line of change and that two in data. But in a actual use case, I'll have the full file over here, multiple files, I'll have to go through all of them. I'll check all of the changes that have been made. If they look good, they make sense. Uh, and uh, if they are synthetically correct, uh, then I'll go ahead and finish my review and approve the changes. If there's any changes required, 
then I need to ask uh, here to request the changes. In this case, I'm just going to comment it out, saying that uh, you need to make the changes. When you actually looked at that uh, uh, checks over here, so every whenever you create a pull request, you have some checks that it needs to pass through before it can be merged to the uh, the target branch. In in our case over here, so a review is required, which I would be providing. There's an unresolved conversation which I just put over there that it, uh, there's a typo that Vinayak needs to resolve, and you will see at the bottom that merging is blocked. So unless until all these checks are passed, merging can't be enabled. So in this case, uh, Vinayak will again take over. He'll make the fixes, and then I'll do the uh, I'll give him the approval to uh, push the changes, uh, merge his changes to target branch. Okay, uh, I'll go to uh, my repository and uh, go to the pull request and. I'll see that uh, Amit has asked for some changes. Now what I need to do is I need to again commit changes from my local branch to this branch hosted on GitHub. And as in the VS code, I'm already checked out on that branch. What I'll do is I'll like make changes here. And uh, as soon as I make change, uh, source control will again uh, pick it. Source control has picked the changes which I had done. Now I again need to, uh, commit, uh, stage these changes first and write a commit message and commit this file. I need to sync changes. So what it will do is it will uh, push this code from local machine to the uh, GitHub hosted repository. And as, a, as soon as I do it, it will again uh, refire the GitHub validation action pipeline, right? Uh, let's go to GitHub and refresh this page. I'll see I've committed again and it is showing me that this, this commit, right? I've done the modifications and as soon as I do it, it will again try to validate what changes I've pushed are uh, legitimate or not and uh, against the target org, right? So what uh, it will do is it will again like uh, run the Salesforce CLI command, authorize it, and uh, try to validate using the, try to validate the delta changes only in the target org. Now, uh, as you can see, the pipeline builds are successful of GitHub Actions. Validation is done, and our code is OK to be merged. Yeah. So again, I'll come in over here. He has already made uh, the comment saying that uh, the changes what I, what I requested have been completed. So I'll quickly jump over to my uh, GitHub uh, login and from over here, I'll refresh it. In the conversation itself, I can see that the conversation has been resolved. So title here, Vinayak has already changed that. And now I can go and again take a look at this. Okay, the title now looks good. The typo has been removed. So I can review it and approve it. Now that I've approved it, you'll see all the checks are completed and the merge pull request button is enabled. It's, uh, GitHub is also saying merging can be performed now automatically. Let's summarize it all up. So you looked at like uh, CICD, how it works in action. Uh, let's talk about uh, the advantages that you get from it. The demo we showed here in this case was pretty simple. And you might have a question like, why not just do those validations myself? Why not trigger it from VS Code? And of course, like. In this example, it would be much faster if you do that that way. But with CICD, when you are actually working in a project environment and you have like many files that you need to work upon, change, and actually deploy to uh, the higher environment, have them tested, validated, reviewed, that all process is streamlined by CICD. And it basically patches all the loopholes. Like uh, if your developer is uh, like skipping over the environments and directly deploying to UAT, so that can no longer be done when you're in a CICD, uh, uh, CICD approach. So, and also, it of course, provides a tighter feedback loop. So the leads can actually look at whatever changes are made more clearly. The uh, developer doesn't have to actually come to my desk and show me all the changes. He doesn't have to connect with and go make me go over all the changes that he has made. It's much easier for me to review the changes. And essentially what happens at the end is when you follow the CICD approach uh, for your deployments, you get less bugs in your uh, production environment, and uh, uh, you get a reliable and tested process that you can follow on again and again till your final release. 
So that was everything. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. I'll quickly request everyone to give a round of applause to our speakers who have put in a lot of effort. <laughs>